Welcome to the United States Studies webinar on Josh Rogan's fascinating and timely new book, Chaos Under Heaven, Trump, Xi, and Battle for the 21st Century. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia. The University of Sydney stands on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Now, to many, last week's rhetorical fireworks in Anchorage between China's Yang Jiechi and Wang Yi and the United States Tony Blinken and Jake Sullivan might have seemed shocking, unsettling, and at least on the Chinese side, particularly long-winded. But to anyone who's actually had the opportunity to read Josh's new book, they've known that the Biden team seems to have actually gotten off quite lightly. In one of the many incredibly reported details in this book, Josh writes about the first meeting between the Trump transition team and their Chinese counterparts. On December 9th, 2016, Yang Jiechi, the same state counselor who held forth for 16 minutes in Anchorage last week, went on for an hour straight. Now, that's a pretty long opening statement, so both sides took a break. And yet, when they sat back down at the table, Yang proceeded to repeat the entire diatribe for another hour. Uh, this, in Josh's telling, was the precursor to the last four years of an increasingly fraught and often quite turbulent relationship between Washington and Beijing. His book chronicles that period and offers a range of insights from the battles among and between Trump's advisors for access and influence to the origins of the US Indo-Pacific strategic framework to a larger discussion of the gradual awakening of the American public to the malign activity and influence of the Chinese Communist Party. To discuss all this, John Lee and I are pleased to welcome Josh Rogan to Australia, uh, albeit virtually, to talk about his new book. Uh, now, Josh is the perfect person to talk about this. He's a columnist for the Global Opinion section of the Washington Post and a political analyst with CNN. Previously, he has covered foreign policy and national security for Bloomberg View, Newsweek, The Daily Beast Foreign Policy Magazine, Congressional Quarterly, Federal Computer Week magazine, and Japan's Ashai Shimbaum. Josh, that's a lot of, a lot of credentials there. Uh, he was also the 2011 recipient for the Interaction Award for Excellence in International Reporting. Josh holds a BA in International Affairs from George Washington University and studied at Sophia University in Tokyo, Japan. He lives in Washington, DC. I would also add for everyone who's watching and who aspires to make sense of Washington's politics and foreign policy, especially the ever-expanding scope of US-China competition. Josh is an indispensable source, and I commend not only his terrific book, but his weekly column. All right, here's the game plan. John and I will talk with Josh about Trump's approach to the US-China relationship, about the downward spiral between Beijing and Washington that intensified with the coronavirus, and about the present, what things are looking like in Washington now under Biden. We'll also work to broaden the discussion to include those of you who are watching. So if you want to submit a question, please, please make sure it's as short as possible. You can post it right through and John and I will do our best to sift through uh, them and get to as many as possible. All right, uh, Josh, if it's all right with you, I've got the book here, everyone should buy it right now. But one of the most interesting things to me begins right at the beginning uh, with the title or even with the epigraph. If you open up the book, uh, the epigraph to the book reads, there is great chaos under heaven. The situation is excellent, and it's attributed to Mao Zedong. Uh, I was hoping you could just start off our discussion by explaining why you chose that epigraph, both uh, at the beginning of the book and for the title. What did it mean to Mao? And in the context of the book, what does it mean? Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Charles and John, for uh, hosting me in this event. Thanks to everyone for attending, you know, chaos under heaven, the quote is attributed to Mao. We couldn't actually figure out if he actually ever said it, but it expresses the sentiment uh, at the time that, you know, the, the, that Mao and, and, and uh, his, his cohorts believed that disorganization and chaos amongst his enemies was a benefit to his agenda. And, you know, when I covered the Trump administration's China policy, but not just their China policy, all their policies really, Chaos was baked into their DNA. You had a, a president with no governing experience, uh, a, a fractious, factional infighting that uh, started in the campaign and never really ended. And just a sort of mishmash of messaging and signaling mixed with overall government dysfunction. Uh, none of this will be news to any of you who follow this, but the, it, the China 
issue did not escape the overall chaos that consumed not only the Trump administration and the White House, but uh, U.S. politics during this time. And, you know, basically what I argue in the book is that this uh, clash, this confrontation, this rising sort of sense in American politics and in American society that a rising China posed new and uh, challenging problems for American security, prosperity, freedom, and public health uh, was coming anyway. And that, you know, this is the result of years, if not decades, of unaddressed problems with the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese government's behavior ab abroad and especially inside of our borders. Of course, this is an issue that uh, I need not explain to an Australian audience because you've been dealing with this in your politics and in your uh, media for quite some time. But in, a, in the United States in prior to 2016, it was a relatively new and undiscussed phenomenon and the issues of not only Chinese Communist Party uh, influence operations and interference, but also uh, the rising uh, domestic repression and external aggression of the Chinese government under the Xi Jinping regime uh, was simply not well understood, much less well discussed in our politics. And of course, the Trump campaign was based on the premise that Trump was going to change all of that. And that's what his campaign advisors believed. And that's what they wrote into his campaign speeches. But of course, you no know, battle plan survives first contact with the enemy. And in this case, the enemy was inside the house. And you know, that story that you told about, uh, that opens the book about uh, uh, Counselor Young meeting with the Trump team uh, during the transition in Jared Kushner's office, it's 666 Lexington Avenue. Uh, that was a crucial story, not because of what we can see now, which is that uh, Young's message to the Trump team was exactly the same as his message to the Biden team, uh, that the West should not interfere in China's core affairs, that the territorial integrity of China must not be questioned, that you know the countries should enter into a new model of great power relations based on win-win cooperation and mutual respect and all the rest. That message has been amazingly consistent. Uh, now in 2021, that's what the Chinese leadership is saying in public. But in 2016, this was a message that Yang delivered in private. And the reason that he was doing that on and during the transition, the reason that he was scolding the incoming Trump team was very clear at the time. It was because uh, President-elect Trump had taken a call from Taiwanese President Tsai Ing-wen uh, exactly one week earlier, and uh, breaking about 40 years of precedent in US-China relations. And in the book, I also tell the story of how that call came to be, which is not the story you read in the New York Times, by the way. It's totally different. Uh, Trump didn't realize what he was doing, and his staff put it on his call sheet and had him do the call without explaining to him the implications. And, you know, that was a, a mess for a number of reasons. On, on the one hand, it was a mess because uh, when Trump realized that it was portrayed as a, a blunder, uh, both in the, by, in the American press and uh, as an insult to his Chinese interlocutors, he went cold on Taiwan and he, that affected U.S. Taiwan policy for years, in fact. Uh, but more importantly, uh, it contradicted the message that was being given directly to the Chinese leadership on that very exact same day by Henry Kissinger, who had traveled all the way to Beijing uh, to meet with Xi Jinping and Wang Zhishang and to deliver a message straight from the president-elect that everything was going to be fine, that we're going to have cooperative and stable and relations and, and all of that. So you can just imagine the scene during that transition where you had total confusion inside the Trump team and total confusion in Beijing and total you know, conflicting messages coming from the same exact people and that was before they even got inaugurated. So that's the definition of chaos as far as I can tell. And it only went really downhill from there. Uh, okay, so uh, the title really works for everything and everything on the approach there. Uh, actually, let me uh, dig in a little bit, Josh, uh, because you had just talked about um, that this was a larger thing that was building. And one of the things that I thought was really interesting in the book and that really ran throughout it is that in all of your interviews and all of the reporting, in, um, with almost every figure that you talked to for the book, it seemed that at some point, everyone had some kind of aha uh, moment uh, when they woke up to the challenge posed by the illiberal nature of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, but uh, you write this, and I think you put it quite well, the nature of that awakening was quite different for different people uh, who work and play in different sectors and who reside sometimes in very different countries. 
and I was hoping you could talk a little bit about some of the examples of the variety of the range of that awakening, what it might look like to different people who work in different sectors and sometimes come from different countries. Yeah, sure. I mean, it just was obvious in, in the, you know, over 300 or so interviews that I conducted. And I kept hearing this over and over again from uh, people inside government, outside government, and around various institutions of U.S. society that uh, the fact that the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party's actions uh, affected Americans in their daily lives uh, uh, became too obvious to ignore. And the problematic effects of that uh, engagement and the way that that engagement was being used by the Chinese government and the Chinese Communist Party uh, to advance the party's interests against the security, prosperity, freedom, and public health of Americans uh, was a very difficult thing for people to discuss. And eventually, the, that discussion was forced upon them by the sheer reality of and the scope and the scale of how uh, the Chinese Communist Party's actions were affecting them, you know, and there were certain watershed moments throughout the book. I mean, just for one example, you know, when the Chinese government punished the NBA over the tweet of one of its uh, managers and the punishment was like, what, like amounted to hundreds of billions of dollars of economic, you know, pain, you know, for an entire segment of American society who weren't tuned into the China challenge, that was an aha moment. They were like, oh my God, we, you know, we, we can't, believe that we're not allowed to tweet things now, you know, and that happened to a bunch of different companies like Marriott and Coach, et cetera. And so the exportation of China's social credit system, which really ramped up uh, in 2017, 2018, that woke a lot of people up. Another thing was that uh, the, the evidence that petered out slowly but surely over the course of 2018 and 2019 about the mass atrocities being committed against the Uyghurs and other ethnic minorities, uh, for a lot of regular Americans, that shocked their consciences. I know it shocked mine and sort of brought home the idea that this was a, a, a party, the Chinese Communist Party was capable of really, you know, horrible mass atrocities against its own people, mostly Muslims, not just Muslims, you know, Tibetans and, you know, and the Hong Kong crackdown was another moment of awakening. But, you know, a, before that happened, you know, and this is what I try to document is that inside the government, you know, previously the China issue was really relegated to the uh, China hands. And this was a huge problem in many ways because, you know, an entire generation of mostly older China hands were very uh, stuck in their assumptions and in their relationships. And a lot of the uh, experts were, had conflicts of interests. And essentially when the national security officials and then the health officials and then the intelligence officials, and then the, you know, Congress started to get involved, uh, they started to force conversations that you know, a lot of the people in the China hand community, frankly, didn't want to have. And as they were doing that, they were, uh, these conversations were also erupting in other parts of American society, including academia, Silicon Valley, and Wall Street, and Hollywood, just to name a few. And the problem was that because the Trump administration was so unpopular for a lot of really good and obvious reasons, uh, when the national security team from the Trump administration came and knocking on the door at your campus or at your Silicon Valley tech company or at your Wall Street investment firm, it didn't go well, you know? And again, for, I, 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 I feel like an Australian audience gets this because uh, this played out in your, uh, in your country before it played out in ours, frankly. But because of the idiosyncrasies of our system and because, you know, in America, we think everything's about us and nothing's real until it happens to us. You know, when, when, when all of these sectors started to grapple with these issues, uh, it was as if there had been no uh, uh, history of it. It, it, it. it was as if it had happened to them for the first time. And there were fights both inside these institutions and between them and between the government and these institutions. And those fights continue to this day. And then inside the administration, you also had a lot of people who were advocating for a lot of different interests. And, you know, that, that, that's a long way of saying that what I witnessed over the last four years was like a, not only a, an opening of the Overton window of like acceptable policy options and what, what we're allowed to, you know, propose in terms of dealing with a shared challenge, which is the, the, the actions of the Chinese government as China rises, uh, but we had to expand the number of people who were allowed to talk about it. And slowly but surely, I think that's 
actually happening in Washington. And now, you know, whether you're, it's not just a, a State Department NSA issue. Now all the parts of government are, are involved and it's not just a Washington issue. Uh, these conversations are happening on campuses and in Wall Street firms and in Hollywood and Silicon Valley. And that's, a, that's not to say it's going great, you know, but, but at least, you know, we, there's a, a common understanding that, you know, what happens in Beijing doesn't stay in Beijing and that uh, China's rise is something that we'll have to uh, address as a government, but also as a society. And unfortunately, and I'll just close here, is that, you know, one of the problems with the way that this unfolded in the United States is that the China issue became hyper-politicized. And that's partially because of the Trump administration's actions, but not only because of the Trump administration's actions. And that resulted in a, 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 a really uh, sad and tragic unforced error on the, on the part of uh, the U.S. side, because uh, now, as we see, on the one hand, uh, some people are abusing the Chinese issue to promote ideas that, that fuel uh, a pro problematic uh, hatred and violence against Asians and Asian Americans in our country. And on the other side, uh, some people are very reluctant to deal with the problems caused by the Chinese Communist Party because this was an initiative started in large part by the Trump administration, which is, remains unpopular to this day. Um, there's a lot there. Um... Let me just, uh, one thing that, that I just want to kind of underline because I want to come back to it. I know that John will as well is, I thought that was a fascinating response that you gave that most people woke up to this. Those who are not national security hands inside the government, uh, not so much when things were happening in China, uh, but when the Chinese government tried to affect things that Americans could do in America. Uh, and tried to, in many ways, control what was allowable speech within America. Um, but I do want to just focus on, because this is such a key part of your book, the fights that you talked about. Uh, you know, your book, in many ways, is an analysis of the continual clash and the occasional recombination of the kaleidoscope of different factions of those who thought about China. And if you haven't read the book yet, for those of you who are listening, uh, Josh lays out that there are the su super hawks, there are the hardliners, there's the Wall Street click, the axis of adults, and others, those who you can't even fit into the, one of those categories. So uh, you don't have to run through all those, but I'm curious, as you watch this kind of develop over time, what made one or multiple of groups gain or lose Trump's favor at any given moment? Right. So, you know, it's it's often said that Trump administration didn't have a China strategy. The truth is that they had several strategies and those strategies changed over time because the the teams changed over time because it was rife with turnover and uh, uh, generally uh, the factions formed a, what I call assorted alliances based on overlapping interests and different factions had different champions in the administration at different times. And, you know, at, at the, uh, the aperture for uh, China policy was opened or closed based on the president's own instincts and his own behavior and his own perception of the relationship and where the trade negotiations were. And, you know, basically what happened was um, in the Super Hawks, which is like Bannon and Peter Navarro and Stephen Miller, uh, these are people who want to bring down the CCP. These are people who believe that, you know, for whatever reason, the mission of U.S. foreign policy uh, should be to, you know, Changed the regime in 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 China, and now I, I I happen not to agree with that. I don't think that's the goal of U.S. policy, nor should it be. But this is how they thought, and they had also combined this with economic nationalism and a uh, the Trumpian sort of MAGA push against elites in both parties, and they wrapped this sort of anti-CCP rhetoric in the in the in the cloak of American populism in a new way, you know. And that was what the campaign was about. So you could imagine that when they got into the White House, they thought they would have control of the policy, but that wasn't the case at all. And as soon as Trump became president, he basically handed over the reins of the policy to Jerry Kushner, who was aligned with a bunch of Wall Street billionaires who were representing a bunch of business interests and who had a lot of their own separate relationships. And their mission was to get a trade deal as quickly as possible. And you know that the, the, the super hawks were sidelined, okay? And they were very upset about this. Now the hardliners, which are more like Pottinger and you know to some extent uh, people like John Bolton and you know Chris Ray and a lot of people inside the system, uh, they didn't have the ball at either time. They weren't the politically powerful people, but they 
worked behind the scenes to steer the government towards the outcomes that they desired. And basically what they did was they uh, yielded control of the policy, not that they had much of a choice, uh, to the Wall Street people, to Jared and Mnuchin and you know, Wilbur Ross to an extent, for a while to give them a chance to fail. And their essential bet was that the Chinese government wouldn't give Trump what he wanted, which was a, a good enough deal to run on. You know, they, they essentially believed that China, China, China's government wasn't going to change. They weren't going to essentially you know, restructure their entire industrial policy because of whatever Trump was saying or whatever pressures the U.S. could bring to bear. Uh, so they had a longer term view. And, you know, basically what they what they did inside the system was they tried to steer the trade negotiations and essentially the trade deal towards one that uh, even if it happened would still uh, uh, result in a new economic equilibrium between the U.S. and China. In other words, a lot of people look at that trade deal and they think, oh, well, you know, that's relatively insignificant trade deal based on $50 billion worth of soybeans or whatever. But what the hardliners were doing was they were making sure that the tariffs were targeted at the industries that China was uh, um, building in order to control the technologies of the future. And especially on how China was exporting those technologies and seeking to use them to control markets abroad, especially in free and open societies. Uh, so the, the hardliners ended up winning out uh, you know, not I think because they were had better Machiavellian tactics, but because they their their bet on Beijing turned out to be right. In other words, the CCP proved them right, uh, and the Chinese leadership never really gave Trump a, a transformative trade deal. And the trade deal, once it was in effect, only lasted two days because the pandemic hit two days later, or within a, a number of days later, and the relationship went downhill from there. And, you know, and all that time you have these people called what I call the axis of adults who are like these senior military guys like Jim Mattis and John Kelly and and their job, they were trying to navigate between all of these, you know, crazy MAGA people and the hardliners and the Wall Street people. And, you know, basically they thought that they were defending the Republic from the Mad King and that their job was to protect democracy from Trump and that really annoyed Trump. And so eventually they all got uh, uh, excised or, or left or quit or got fired one way or the other. Um, so I guess that's a lot, just to, just to, to put a, a, a bow on it, you know, you know, what the, 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 the press coverage of the U S China relationship over these last four years is what I like to call, uh, the weather, you know what I mean? And the shift of inside the government and inside American society is what I like to call the climate, right? And it's, everyone follows the weather. And if you're in the news, you write about the weather, you know, and, and nobody really can follow climate change because it happens more slowly. But in the end, it's a lot more significant. So, you know, we have this sort of warped understanding of what happened in the relationship because it was all filtered through the coverage of the trade negotiations, which are actually a very small part of what was going on. So what I tried to do in this book is to describe the climate change, you know, and the weather and the climate change are related, but they're not the same thing. Gosh, let me move to the pandemic because it's uh, still under the shadow of COVID-19 that, that a lot of Australians understand things. Um, and the, the, the pandemic issue in the Trump White House was a particularly interesting issue, I think, for us and obviously for you guys as well. Um, in your book, you write, uh, Beijing's efforts from the very start of the crisis, the hard information, silence whistleblowers, put out false data, thwart any real investigation, now we all know that that we all know that happened, but you also conclude that the Chinese government's actions, uh, to use your words, were reckless but deliberate. Uh, what do you actually mean by that? Yeah, well, you know, just think of January fifteenth, twenty twenty, when uh, uh, the Chinese delegation was at the White House celebrating the trade deal, and President Trump at that speech announced that this would be a new era of peace and prosperity in U.S.-China relations and. You know, they didn't mention the strange new flu that was spreading around China, though they had some information about it already. It never came up. They just got on the plane and left and never said a word. And sooner, days after that, the information started pouring in. And, you know, the, the, the story that I tell in the book about those early weeks of the pandemic is a, a, fra a crazy one and a really disturbing one, actually, when you think about it, because you had national security officials and eventually health officials sounding the alarm about the pandemic. And, uh, you know, the president of the United States was getting conflicting information because his political officials were telling him to downplay it. 
And in the end, the tiebreaker was Xi Jinping himself, who in two personal phone calls with Trump told him many lies about the virus, including that it would go away in warm weather, uh, that herbal medicine could be used to treat it, that it was under control. And, you know, Trump believed those lies, or at least wanted to believe them, because it, he believed it was his interest to believe them. And they made their way into his head and contributed to the garble that came out of his mouth and contributed to the garble policy that we had in the United States. Now, if that was the only transgression, that would be one thing. But as we now know, uh, China was, going, uh, was doing a lot more on their side to suppress information, to suppress science, to suppress journalism, um, and that to withhold information from the international community, crucial information at a crucial time, which fed into a garbage in, garbage out kind of loop. And you know, when you see that same misinformation come out of world bodies and then come out of the President of the United States' mouth, it helps to explain how we got into this disaster. And that doesn't absolve the United States government of any of the severe mistakes that it made, but it just adds some context. Now, the two other things that they, they did, and I report on this extensively in the book, was they went to the State Department and they uh, blackmailed the U.S. government by threatening to withhold crucial PPE and masks and other uh, vital aid in the worst part of our pandemic, uh, uh, unless they shut up about China's handling of the coronavirus pandemic at that time. And this was a message delivered from Xi personally to Trump, but also uh, delivered at the diplomat to diplomat level in explicit terms. And, you know, this, again, this won't come as a shock to Australians because, you know, of course, the Chinese government's black, you know, used economic coercion to punish your country horrendously in the middle of a pandemic for calling for an investigation into the origins, which is, you know, horrible. And, you know, but in, in the United States, it was a, it was a, it wasn't as well known at the time. And so the U.S. government officials were in this horrible position where they were trying desperately to get, you know, what was often American equipment from American, all of them when the chips were down. And this war of words ended up sowing a lot of disinformation into our information space and into our understanding of, of what was going on. And, and, and you know, uh, that, made, that turned a lot of people inside the U.S. government against the, the, the Chinese government who weren't already against it. And then when you talk about the origin of the coronavirus, and we can talk about this as little as much as you, as you want, um, you know, uh, the, 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 the sheer amount of, of misinformation, disinformation, and propaganda that Beijing has put out, continues to put out, uh, in order to dissuade anyone from asking any reasonable questions about the data that they hold that might lead us to that crucial scientific information, adds another layer of culpability. In other words, the origin story is not just about blame. You know, unless we trace the origin of the outbreak, uh, we're missing vital scientific information that we need to prevent the next outbreak. And to this day, the Chinese government is thwarting uh, honest efforts to trace that outbreak. And I'm not saying I know how the virus out broke out, and I'm not saying that you know, nobody knows. But I'm saying that we need to know and that we need to investigate all possible theories, including the lab accident theory. And uh, you know, China continues the Chinese government continues to stonewall us. So if you add all of that up, it's hard to avoid the obvious conclusion that uh, the Chinese government's actions on a number of fronts greatly exacerbated uh, uh, the, the suffering and death uh, for people all over the world. And that is a measure of accountability that I don't think anyone's going to forget about anytime soon. And then, you know, when you look at what the, when you just think about it, what the Chinese, the opportunity that the Chinese government blew, you know, to just to think how, what the first mover advantage gave them, the ability to show the world what a, a China as a global superpower would, would really look like. You know, they had the chance to, to use that power and the fact that they had the most science and the most masks and the most information to help the world. But in, instead of doing that, which would have been in their diplomatic interest, they protected the party the party's political interest, okay? They prize that above their own national interest. And that, I think, tells you all you need to know about how the Chinese government is operating right now. And that, in and of itself, is a, a, a cold realization that I think we all have to wrap our minds around. All right, so, so let, let, let's actually talk about the implications of, of those actions or the nature of the Chinese Communist Party and, and, and the particularly the geopolitical, geostrategic implications since uh, February last year. 
Now, we've seen China's mass diplomacy. Uh, we've seen its military aggression against uh, India, against Taiwan. Uh, we've seen what's happened in Hong Kong. We've seen these vaccines for political favors story emerging. Uh, we, we've got these flotilla of hundreds of Chinese ships in Filipino waters in the South China Sea. Now, that, that isn't great for China's standing or soft power, but uh, China seems to have emerged, not necessarily in a better position, but certainly she has advanced a lot of his geostrategic gains in the last 12 months and seems to be intent on doing so. Um, has China, in that geostrategic sense, not reputational, but geostrategic sense, emerge in a better place than it was 12 months ago, or is that misreading the situation? You know, uh, when, 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 you know, you mentioned a bunch of things that they did during the pandemic that I hadn't even brought up, you know, when you just think about, you know, the incursion into India and all of the other regional examples that you just laid out, you know, it seems pretty clear to me that, again, the Chinese government made a conscious decision to abuse uh, the pandemic to advance uh, its interests to the detriment of its neighbors on a number of fronts, right? I mean, that's, that's, what, you're, that's what you're laying out now. Does that leave China in a better short term position? Perhaps. But in the long term, I think it's devastating. And, you know, when you when I saw the when I when you saw the quad meeting that happened between the, the leaders of Australia, Japan and India and the United States just before uh, the U.S. and Chinese officials met in Alaska, when I talked to Biden administration officials and I said, oh, how did you get the Indians on board? They all, they all said the same thing. They're like, no, no, no. The Indians were the most enthusiastic. And it was actually the Japanese who are a little bit reluctant. We can talk about that if you want. Uh, in other words, China's, uh, there's, a, there's a, a, a belief inside the US government that uh, our, our more competitive, more aggressive, perhaps more confrontational approach to the CCP's bad behavior uh, has forced Xi Jinping to speed up his plans, to sort of take away some of the subterfuge and to be more bold. And in doing that, he's made some mistakes and there's more bullying and there's more aggressiveness and perhaps we're seeing more of the true character of the party than they wanted us to see in the past and you know that doesn't mean that's that's a good thing and a bad thing for us right in the one sense it's a it it it, it makes the the their strategies so much more obvious and hard to debate and it also proves that you know sort of it doesn't the you don't destroy the relationship by confronting the ccp bad behavior and you know one of the tropes that we hear in washington all, all the time is oh well you can't do anything to challenge Chinese, Chinese government's bad behavior because then we'll just destroy the relationship. We'll have a cold war. What do you want a cold war? What are you crazy? And you know what we found during the Trump administration is that no, actually that's not what happens, and that the Chinese government still has the reason to interact and negotiate and engage even when we're being tough and standing up for the things that we believe in. Uh, but I think it's you know troubling in a sense in the, that you know again if you just thought about it for a second you would realize that China's making a lot of rash and bullying and harsh decisions that if it's not in its interest, then why are they doing that? And I think a lot of people in Washington are asking the question of whether or not the, the consolidation of power inside that system has resulted in the lack of their ability to sort of change course and the, the destruction of the internal dissent mechanisms. And, you know, who's going to stand up to Xi Jinping and be like, no, 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 we got to, you know, be a little bit nicer to Taiwan. You, you can't do that, you know, anymore, the way, at least not in the way that you could, even internally. And that is scary for a lot of important reasons, because, you know, if we're putting China to a choice, the Chinese government to a choice of, of, of responding to our pressure by doubling down or by backing off, and they don't have the ability to back off because their system has destroyed its own internal uh, uh, dissent mechanisms, well, that's going to be a really tough thing to deal with. And that's so I, I, I just think that means that, you know, it's going to get worse before it gets better. You know, uh, Josh, uh, you were talking about, uh, and I found this really interesting, that you're, you're trying to trace not only the day-to-day, -day, right, but but the weather patterns, what's happening in the background. Uh, and the this is a larger kind of muscle movement that we're beginning to see emerge. But one of the things uh, that you talk about, which I've said consistently over, you know, the three and a half years that I got to spend in Australia was that this is not Trump uh, alone. <laughs> we disaggregate what's happening from the larger body politic in America. And so one of the larger questions uh, as we fast forward in some ways to the present moment is how bipartisan is this and can the center hold? 
Uh, and you wrote about this just last week in your column uh, discussing uh, the Senate, the Democratic Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer's uh, instructions to the eight different committees in the Senate who are now writing legislation to piggyback off of the either a hundred billion or a hundred and ten billion dollar effort that's not even in the military space, right? This is just on investments into tech, investments into R and D, investments into supply chains, um, and yet in your column uh, you had wrote that even at this relatively early stage of the Biden administration, uh, Schumer's China initiative is falling victim to partisan politics and bureaucratic dysfunction. So, you know, I, I guess I, I'd be interested to hear your take on what do you think the implications would be of attaining and of squandering that bipartisanship at this particular moment? Right. To be clear, there's very little bipartisanship in Washington on anything, especially the China issue. And, uh, you know, it's really unfortunate. And both parties deserve blame, although the Trump administration des uh, deserves the lion's share. And, uh, you know, this is in part because during the election, the Republican Party decided to attack all of its enemies as uh, pro-CCP, regardless of whether that was true or not. And I'm sure in some cases it was in some cases that weren't, and they ramped up the anti-China and also the anti-Asian rhetoric, which put the virus, uh, became highly, highly politicized. And uh, that was, again, very unfortunate and a self-inflicted wound. And of course, the, we have to realize that the Chinese Communist Party, uh, much like the Russian government, uh, seeks every opportunity to inflame our internal divisions to undermine our democracy and also to corrupt our information space and to draw a false equivalence between the real uh, problems in our society and the uh, mass atrocities they're committing against their own people. So, it, you know, in that kind of crazy in, uh, information environment in the middle of 2020, uh, unfortunately, a lot of arbitrary battle lines were set that are really hard to dismantle at this point. So if you're a Democrat on Capitol Hill, well, you really want the Republicans to make sure that they include anti- uh, uh, Asian American and Pacific Islander uh, um, uh, hate as an issue in the China challenge. And I think they're right about that. But if you're a Republican, you really want the Democrats to include an investigation into the origins of the coronavirus and China's behavior. And I think they're right about that, but neither side can agree on that other piece. And it's a big problem. And then, you know, one of, you know, one of the, the common tropes you'll hear is that, oh, well, the Chinese government really wanted uh, um, Biden to win, but you know it's not clear that that was to me that that was the case at all. And you could make an argument either way. And I think I hear a lot from uh, close people who watch the Chinese uh, leadership closer than me that actually you know what the Biden administration represents is a chance to take a lot of the good things that the Trump administration did in turning America's attention towards the China challenge, and then fix a lot of the bad things, including its mistreatment of allies, including its mistreatment of Australia, by the way. And I got a couple stories about that if you're interested. Uh, and actually do a better job in internationalizing uh, the response to Ch the Chinese Communist Party's bad actions. And I think that's what the Biden administration wants to do. Uh, but so far, it's not going well. You know, and just to talk about that Schumer bill for a minute, what the Schumer did was, and, you know, he, he tried to take a, a bill that was a domestic priority for Democrats and rebrand it as a China bill. And then he told everyone in the Senate to throw in their China ideas and we'll just make a cornucopia of China legislation. And to do something like that on the fly for something that's so complex and so important, especially at a time where Congress is, you know, there's like barricades everywhere and people don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. And the committee's all just switched around. You got a bunch of new senators, don't even know where their offices are. And to rush through a major piece of China legislation in that manner is unserious. And that's what the, that's what that's why they're having the problems that they're having now. And so again, I think, you know, you know, aspirationally, I hope that there a bipartisan centrist sort of moderate uh, coalition emerges on the China challenge. There'll always be some on the far left and some on the far right who don't agree with whatever it is uh, that the majority of uh, people in our uh, Washington establishment establishment, so to speak, want to do. Uh, but that hasn't happened yet. Right now, we're still uh, licking the wounds of a very, very uh, uh, ugly election season. And, you know, the, neither party has made the decision that uh, 
you know, joining together to approach the China challenge is worth setting aside some of their domestic uh, political uh, opportunities. And uh, so it's, it's, it's not a pretty picture as of, as of this moment. Uh, Josh, let's, let's talk about um, domestic divisions. And, and as you would know, it's always an issue that we're grappling with here. Um, you mentioned in, in this talk and also in, in your book, um, the violence against Asian Americans or in, in your column. Um, now, we know the Chinese Communist Party is the one which has weaponized race, if you like, by trying to activate uh, diasporas in our democracies. We also know that the Communist Party uh, um, have been very successful at conflating the party with the Chinese people and the Chinese civilization. Now, all those things being the case, um, how do we actually confront the worst things that Beijing is doing? Uh, and prevent these sorts of violent or racist uh, sentiments in our own countries uh, at the same time. Right. Well, you know, as I said earlier, you know, this is an issue that is actually much more developed and much more uh, uh, covered in Australia than it ever has been in the United States. And when I started to sort of report on what we call Chinese interference and influence operations, some call it United Front operations, uh, some just call it plain old corruption and elite capture, okay, in the purest sense. Um, you know, one of the th first things I did was to reach out to a lot of Australian experts and journalists who had covered this issue to figure out what your experience had been and how your society had gone through uh, this very difficult kind of set of issues to talk about. And, um, you know, of course, the situation is not exactly the same, but uh, there are echoes of it. For example, when I, you know, uh, wrote an article about a US Senator, uh, Steve Daines, taking a bunch of m money from, uh, uh, or, or striking a deal to sell Montana beef in China at the same time doing favors for the CCP in terms of uh, whitewashing atrocities in Tibet. To me, that rang very true to a, a, a similar story of Chinese influence with a Senator from Australia, Sam Dastiari. But in Australia, that was a huge scandal. And in the United States, it was just a ripple you know, because our, it, people here don't understand what the United Front is. And even people in government don't understand how China, uh, you know, both weaponizes, uh, you know, this issue for its, uh, the Chinese Communist Party weaponizes this issue for its own purposes, but also how they try to claim, you know, some sort of ownership of overseas Chinese and then manipulate the overseas Chinese uh, information environment, including by buying up media, by seeding think tanks, by uh, expanding United Front organizations in ways that target uh, overseas Chinese and overseas Asian Americans. And, you know, because that spilled out into our uh, political discussion in the worst possible way during a pandemic that originated in China with a president who was clearly making a lot of racist comments, uh, it really became re really horrible uh, to see that, you know, we couldn't start this discussion on a on a stable footing, but you know, rather than me tell you how you know you should deal with these complicated interests, uh, I think it's more important that Americans learn from Australia's experience, frankly. And not to say that you guys did everything right, by the way, but the idea is to have a national discussion about what these interests are, to e expose and uh, more of this information, and just to enforce the ideals and the practices that will enable a, an actual discussion to take place. And that means a lot of transparency and a lot of accountability and a lot of disclosure. And when you talk about universities, much less forget about the Wall Street companies, they hate that, right? They don't want to do that. And you know, once the government started forcing them to turn over these rocks, uh, everybody was shocked by what they found. And the, what they found is billions and billions of dollars of United Front money and CCP linked influence uh, operations money permeating through our institutions. At the same time, Wall Street firms steering trillions of dollars, actually, of U.S. investors' money into bad acting Chinese companies, companies that are committing atrocities, companies that are building the mil military machine that's pointed at us. Uh, and it was just a mess. And so you had the U.S. government trying to sanction Chinese companies, but Wall Street funding them and universities inviting them onto campuses while the FBI investigated them. And all of those things were happening at once, and it just became a total uh, disaster. So, uh, so we haven't had that national conversation, okay? And I think that's the first step. And I think 
if you want to get everybody on the same page, you talk about transparency, accountability, disclosure, you know, sunlight, okay? And because we can't figure out what to do about the problem if we can't have a shared understanding of what the problem is and what the reality is. And, you know, before we get into how to legislate it, I think it's important for, you know, everybody in, uh, in, in these institutions to realize that, you know, despite the fact that U.S. institutions guard their independence from the U.S. government rightly and proudly and fiercely, it's going to require public-private cooperation. The NBA can't stand up against the CCP without the U.S. government's help, right? Uh, you know, the, the uh, Confucius Institutes, you know, uh, are a problem for universities that place competing interests against each other. They want to have academic openness, but they also want to have uh, academic freedom and, and, and integrity of their institutions. And sometimes those things clash. And, you know, so that's not to say that I have all the answers, just to say that if we start from a baseline of, you know, uh, sort of having a common understanding of the problem, then we can work on how to get to a common understanding of the solutions. Uh, Josh, I'm going to take it over to uh, questions from everyone who's listening because uh, we had a bunch of that people emailed in before they even got on and now I'm starting to see even more come in. So uh, let, let me uh, kind of start sifting through these. Um, first one to you is uh, from Paul Madison, uh, who's from the University of New South Wales Defense Research Institute, uh, but he's actually the former Canadian ambassador to Australia, who's now here permanently. Uh, and here's his question, which is, I think, a good one because it's about the role that Xi Jinping uh, plays in all this. Um, Paul asks, um, assuming a coherent coalition of Western democracies can emerge to exert consistent multilateral pressure on Xi Jinping to change the alarming trajectory of China under uh, the CCP, do you think that will be enough or is Xi Jinping past the point of no return? in driving towards regional hegemony, a new global order, and a celebration of Chinese-style democracy uh, in 2049? Right, good question. So I, I would say a couple of things. First of all, the, the goal, I think, of some in the Trump administration, not the president himself, but some of the hardliners and some of the other officials, was to put Xi Jinping to that choice for the first time. In other words, Apparently, our policy of, uh, you know, neglecting a lot of these rising problems with his, how his government and how the party operates uh, didn't convince him to stop doing any of these things. And the premise wasn't that if we raise the pressure on the Chinese government that he's going to change, right? The pressure was, the, the premise was, if we raise the pressure and change our behavior, then at least it puts him to a choice. And that choice is to either you know, change and, and stop doing some of the worst abuses and respond to the criticisms of the international community in a real way, or pay an ongoing and escalating price for that behavior. In other words, we don't have to be able to predict what Xi Jinping is going to do to form our strategy. And the, the, the cost in and of itself has, a, has a, a huge benefit. And that pressure, as we see it with the tariffs, but not just the tariffs, and the sanctions and the diplomatic pressure, all of that uh, is only as effective as the number of countries that join it. And you know, it's a huge failure of the Trump administration to, to not realize the potential of, of bringing alliances to bear. And because the competition with China is not really uh, gonna be play out on military terms, it's gonna play out in the economic, technological, and yes, ideological and political spheres, you know, it seems clear to me that, you know, that free and open societies, Western democracies, whatever formulation you want to use, uh, have overlapping values and interests. And that doesn't mean they're always going to be the same. It doesn't mean we're always going to agree on everything. But largely, we have a shared uh, interest in um, communicating in to, to the Chinese leadership in, with a, a unified voice and then employing all of these measures in a unified way. And it's a, a darn shame that the Trump administration never bothered to, tr to explain that to our allies until the very end. And at, by that time, the Trump administration was so unpopular in most democracies that democratic governments really didn't have any political space to join in with them on whatever they were proposing. And, you know, because of the pandemic, everyone sort of turned inward, understandably. So I think the answer, I don't know if this will be a satisfying answer as he wants, but I think the answer is that we have to respond to Chinese bad behavior 
because we have to respond to it and we have to do it together. And if Xi Jinping decides to continue it, well, then th there has to be, uh, then that leads us down one path, but at least the cost will be higher, we'll be better protected, our democracies will be more secure, more prosperous, have more freedom, and will ensure our citizens' public health. And then if you, you know, who knows, you know, the future is not written. If their system changes or his mind changes or, you know, his calculation changes, well, then that, that's all to the benefit. But, you know, we're not, we're, we're setting aside this, this hubristic idea that we can change China. Uh, China's development will be determined by the Chinese people. And we're also setting aside this optimistic idea that uh, engagement should have the goal of convincing China to liberalize economically and politically and that that will solve all our, our problems. Uh, that can't be the goal because it doesn't look like that's what's happening. So the best that we can do is uh, raise the cost for the Chinese leadership for the worst behaviors and then, you know, protect ourselves and protect our citizens. Josh, can I just push on something you said? I may have misheard, so correct me if I did. Um, you, you, you said just then that the US-China competition is much more likely to play out in economic and technological terms, not military terms. Uh, why do you say that? Because, um, you know, there is a sentiment in the region, uh, in Australia, in Japan, Taiwan, that the military aspect of the competition is becoming more likely uh, over time rather than less. Did I mishear or, or, or misinterpret what you said? Or, or do you actually think that the military... Yeah. No, I mean, I, 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 I understand what you're saying and I hear the same things from people in the region. I would say that, uh, first of all, that's a little bit of a different ca calculation for countries who are in China's near abroad, who are along those first and second island changes because they have territorial interests in those exact um, uh, areas that are not at the forefront of the US policy making uh, per se, but my point, I, which I stand by, is that you know essentially uh, the 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 U.S. strategic policy has been overly militarized, and if you just think of the resources applied to it and the time and attention applied to it, and the, really the personnel in our system that are applied to it, one of the I think big sea changes in U.S. policy is that you know we realized that we were under resourcing the other parts of the competition, not just confronting China's economic aggression and trade, trade practices and IP theft and all of that, which a lot of people talk about, but you know, what's going, what are, what, what are the real implications of Chinese dominance over 5G artificial intelligence, you know, and all of these other emerging and foundational technologies and how is China exporting its social credit system and its political ideology uh, in ways that constrain our, our freedom and, and the pandemic and with regard to the pandemic harm our public health. So that's not to say that the military aspect is not going to be important going forward. But I'm, you know, I think it's a different calculation in Washington than it is for 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 in the region. I, I think that the 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 prospect of outright military uh, conflict uh, between the US and China is often used as a cudgel to dissuade uh, serious policymakers from uh, uh, standing up to Chinese government behavior on those other fronts. And uh, and also, I think essentially what we're going to eventually find is a essentially a military strategic stalemate and and you know i don't the the, the it's the the that's not to say there aren't risks that need to be managed and strategic calculations about nukes and missiles and all the rest and you know i'm sure that will continue to uh employ lots of people on both sides of the pacific for a long time but the bleeding edge of the competition is the money okay it's the it's the uh, it's the investment it's the uh, um, science, it's the economic competition. That's, that's where, that's the part that we need to shore up. That's the part that we're not thinking about as much as we should. And, uh, you know, that, I guess that's the point that I was trying to make. Yeah, let me pose one more question from the audience for us straight back to Charles. And it's from Carl Rhodes, uh, who's head of Rand Australia. It's a retrospective question, but I think it's an interestingly important one. Um, during the whole flurry of summits or whatever you want, you want to call it between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un, what kind of interaction did President Trump have with Xi Jinping over the North Korean issue? Was she just left out of the issue between the United States and North Korea? Or, what, or from what you know, uh, was there actually a lot of interaction behind the scenes between Trump and Xi? Yeah, the North Korea story with Donald Trump is a crazy story deserves a book of its own, uh, but it was linked to US-China policy, mostly by the Chinese side, uh, in ways that undermined the effectiveness of the US 
strategy, and a, a few of these instances are in the book. At Mar-a-Lago, you know, uh, uh, was the, that was the first time in, in April 2017 where she proposed to Trump that maybe uh, he would help him on North Korea if he got a, some, some more concessions on the trade deal. And Trump blurted this out in an interview when he got back from Mar-a-Lago and he said, well, you know, if we get, if we get North Korea in peace, well, maybe that's worth a, a worse trade deal. And, you know, once he said that, it, it became clear to the Chinese leadership that, you know, the president was willing to link these issues in ways uh, that seemed not to be in the interest of solving any of them. And it actually gave Xi Jinping in incentive to never solve the North Korean problem because uh, he could hold it over Trump's head. And in many of their personal interactions, that's exactly what he did. He held out the prospect of Chinese help on North Korea, um, you know, in order to get Trump to do him favors on other subjects. And Trump fell for this over and over again. Now, that's not to say that Beijing didn't help. It, at first, in fact, they uh, showed a lot of willingness to participate in the drive to increase the pressure on North Korea through sanctions and UN resolutions and all the rest. And uh, once the trade, that was also premised, I think, from the Chinese side on the idea that the trade deal was going to go be a relatively quick process that, and that the Trump administration just wanted to make a deal and that they could get to yes on both fronts. Uh, but once the trade war started, uh, Beijing's cooperation dwindled. And at that point, and once the summit happened, I think the Singapore summit happened, uh, you know, and it was such a, 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 a disaster and kind of like an embarrassment, uh, I think the, the calculation in Beijing changed from one of raising pressure on North Korea to failing North Korea out of that pressure. And we all know the story from there on. It just became a, the, the Trump Kim relationship became a, a joke in Washington, but not a funny one. Uh, so that's a long way of saying that I think the Biden administration realizes the dangers of such linkage, that they're going to not see China as part of the North Korea issue, but rather see North Korea as a subset of the China issue. You know, if, you're, if your only goal is to solve North Korea, well, then you're going to make decisions based on, on the China relationship that aren't in the interest of solving the China challenge. So I think uh, that's a, the, a, a huge uh, a lesson learned from how Trump mismanaged the relationship is you can't let the Chinese leadership dangle the prospect of help on North Korea uh, to distract us from a lot of other important things that we need to deal with them on. All right, Charles has given me time to ask one more question from the audience and it's from Steve and Lucy uh, from the United States Study Center. Um, we're, we're in Australia here, we're getting pretty excited about the Quad, particularly after the leaders meeting last week. Um, would you advise us to temper that excitement? Or do you actually think the Quad is a serious, significant uh, part of the uh, strategic architecture and, and evolution that's occurring in the region? Are you excited about the Quad? You know, I think the Quad is sort of a, a temperature test, okay? It, it's not, it's not a, it, 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 it helps us tell where we are. And just the fact that you had a senior leaders meeting, I think, is a huge, significant, symbolic indication of where we are, which is that, you know, all of a the sudden, uh, these four powers have realized that they have, as I said before, shared interests and shared values in standing up to the Chinese government's strategy and its malign actions across the board. Uh, I don't think the Quad should be seen as the vehicle for responding, and I don't think that's what it's going to become. You know, to the extent that it can be a temperature test and a, a forum for advancing real ideas and uh, for, for coordinating, signaling and messaging and, you know, a billion vaccines, great, absolutely, let's do that. Um, but I don't think we should set our expectations that operationalizing the quad is going to be the answer to this challenge. Uh, for a lot of the reasons that we've already discussed is that, you know, these countries will have their own independent relationships with Beijing that will go up and down over time. And, you know, the calculation and inside the countries, the politics on the China issue are not settled. And, you know, the, 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 the interaction of other um, um, forces on, on how, how we deal with the China challenge are not going to go away. So, you know, I think we should see it as a, a small but symbolic but significant step in the right direction. And the right direction is to realize that, you know, the problems presented by China's rise are not actually a spat between the US and China. That's how it got played in the press, right? But it's actually an international response to 
China's actions as it rises. And, you know, the, the challenges posed by the Chinese Communist Party strategy are impacting not just Americans, Australians, Japanese, Indians, people all over the world, especially uh, uh, due to the pandemic, but not just because of the pandemic. So, you know, all of these uh, structures uh, are, are forming a, what I, like a constellation, a tapestry of, uh, uh, of interactions that are helping us get to a level where we can actually talk about these problems amongst each other. But, you know, that's not a solution. That's just the beginning of a, a shared understanding from which we actually have to build something that's uh, more real, more sustainable to avoid the conflict that neither side seeks, to establish a relationship between China and the rest of the world that we can both live with, okay? That has to be the goal. It's not to uh, mount a Cold War, it's not to contain China, it's not a Thucydides trap, those are bumper stickers. Those are simplifications of a complex challenge that all of our countries are gonna have to work together uh, to talk about and then to confront. Well, that just seems like a, a perfect place to cap this off. Um, Josh, I know <clears throat> right before we started, you had said that uh, some ways uh, the book was perfect, even though you were scribbling right up to the end uh, because it kind of bookends Trump administration. But obviously, there's so much more here. Uh, I think you have your like series of books laid out for you at this point. Um, but uh, let me just uh, thank you very much uh, for staying up, well, only kind of late here in Washington, D.C., I advise everyone who's out there, uh, head to Amazon, head to wherever you go, buy Josh's book. Uh, make sure you read his columns to really check out how this challenge progresses. Uh, and then for everyone who's watching, please make sure that you check out the U.S. Study Center website for information on the upcoming events, publications, videos, and podcasts. And before signing off, uh, let me just make sure that we are thanking uh, the team at USSC who makes all this happen, uh, Janine, Suze, Mari, Taylor, you guys are excellent. This would never happen without uh, you guys. So thank you, Josh, thanks for your time. John, thanks as always, and until next time. Let us know what you think in the comments. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel to catch all of the latest from the United States Study Center.